They called it Madness, a double-headed locomotive with boilers pointing both ways, built for tracks barely two feet apart and curves sharper than a city street corner. In an age when trains derailed just trying to haul Welsh slate down the mountains, this Siamese twin was ridiculed as a mechanical joke. Yet within months, it would outmuscle every rival and win orders from empires abroad. Why would anyone risk their fortune and reputation on something so outrageous? The answer begins with a railway cornered by geometry itself. A railway built for slate, not speed, demanded a geometry that defied every standard in Victorian engineering. The Festiniog Railway's tracks lay just two feet apart, narrow enough that a man could almost straddle both rails. This tight gauge snaked through the Welsh mountains, hugging slopes too steep for wider lines. The path it carved was anything but gentle. Some corners bent so sharply, the rails described an arc with a radius of only 116 feet. That is a curve tighter than most city intersections and far sharper than any mainline railway dared attempt. Every foot of track was a negotiation with gravity. The line climbed at gradients as steep as 1 in 50, forcing trains to twist and rise in the same breath. Survey maps from the era show a pattern of switchbacks and hairpins, each curve pressed up against stone and forest. For a locomotive, these numbers were not just measurements, they were limits. The physics of the wheelbase set a trap. On a rigid framed engine, the driving wheels were fixed in place. The longer the wheelbase, the less it could bend to follow the rail. As the track curved, the wheels tried to go straight, grinding against the steel and threatening to climb right off the railhead. The tighter the curve, the greater the force pushing outward. Even the smallest steam engines, like the early saddle tanks, were forced to run with their axles close together. That meant less power, less weight for traction, and frequent slipping on the grades. These were not curves an ordinary locomotive could master. The two-foot gauge and the 116-foot radius were non-negotiable. They set the boundaries for every design that followed, and they left the Festiniog Railway searching for a machine that could bend without breaking. Before steam, the Festiniog Railway ran on muscle and gravity. In the damp dawn, teams of horses waited at the foot of the slate quarries. Their job was simple but endless. Haul empty wagons up the mountain, one slow mile after another, then trudge back down beside the loaded cars as they rolled to the sea under their own weight. For the slate barons, this was a daily bottleneck. Every year, the mines produced nearly 100,000 tons of slate, but the pace of the railway was set by the stamina of tired animals. On a good day, a single horse might pull six empty wagons up the grade. A full train required a dozen animals, all harnessed in line, led by drivers who knew every rut and stone by heart. Downhill, gravity did the work, but at a cost. Loaded wagons raced ahead, brakesmen riding the iron with wooden shoes, praying the curves would not send them flying. Accidents were common. Horses waited at sidings, chewing through their feed while men coaxed the empties back up. The round trip could swallow half a day. In winter, snow and rain slowed everything to a crawl. Each slate shipment was a gamble against the clock. Delays meant missed ships at the harbor, lost profits, and angry letters from London. The railway managers counted every pound spent on oats, every hour lost to animal fatigue. By the early 1860s, the pressure was mounting. The mines demanded more slate moved, faster and cheaper. Steam promised a solution, but on these curves, no ordinary engine could survive. The men and horses of Festiniog were caught in a losing race, outpaced by the mountain itself. Robert Fairley's patent, filed in 1864 as number 1169, laid out a machine that defied every convention in locomotive design. Instead of a single boiler stretching from cab to chimney, Fairley's blueprint showed two boilers mounted end-to-end -end on a single frame, each projecting out in opposite directions. At the very heart of the machine sat a single oversized firebox, a furnace built wide enough to feed both boilers at once. This central firebox was no afterthought. It was the core of the engine, designed to burn hotter and longer, sending heat in both directions through a pair of boiler barrels. 
The fireman's task was to keep this single fire roaring, ensuring both halves of the locomotive generated full steam. Each boiler supplied its own set of cylinders, one facing forward, one facing back. These cylinders were mounted on swiveling bogies, allowing the entire assembly to pivot beneath the rigid main frame. Steam left the central dome and traveled through flexible copper pipes, snaking down to the engines on each bogey. The bogies themselves were more than just turning wheels, they were the source of the locomotive's power and its agility. With all eight wheels powered, weight was distributed evenly, maximizing grip on the rails even as the track twisted through impossible curves. The symmetrical design meant there was no true front or back. The locomotive could run in either direction without turning around, a rare advantage on a railway with no room for turntables. The cabs and controls were clustered around the central firebox, squeezed between the twin boilers. This arrangement made for a cramped workspace, but it allowed a single crew to operate what was in effect two engines at once. Fairley's patent diagrams reveal the logic behind every line. A machine engineered to conquer the sharpest bends and steepest grades, not by brute force, but by flexibility. The double boiler layout, the central firebox, and the swiveling bogies all served one purpose, to keep the locomotive on the rails no matter how the track twisted ahead. All eight wheels under Fairley's machine were driven, but none were locked in place. Each bogey, one at each end, could pivot like a dancer's foot, letting the locomotive hug the rails no matter how wild the curve. On the Festiniog's twisting track, this meant every ounce of the engine's weight pressed down for traction, instead of fighting sideways against the bends. Where a rigid locomotive would grind its flanges and slip, Fairley's design simply turned with the track, keeping steel on steel and power on the rails. This wasn't just a trick of geometry, it was a promise of efficiency. With all wheels powered, the locomotive could pull heavier loads without needing extra engines or complicated double heading. Even better, Fairley claimed his monster needed only a single driver and one fireman, just two men to do the work of two separate engines. No more leapfrogging crews or shunting locomotives at every terminus. The symmetrical design meant the train could run forward or backward with equal ease, a rare advantage on a railway with no turntables and no space to spare. At the heart of this system sat a network of flexible copper pipes, channeling steam from the central firebox to the cylinders on each swiveling bogey. These pipes had to bend and flex every time the locomotive took a curve, carrying high-pressure steam to both ends without leaking or bursting. It was an elegant solution on paper. In practice, Every joint and bend became a test of Victorian metallurgy. The more the engine twisted, the more those copper pipes were forced to flex, and the more likely they were to crack under the strain. Fairley's gamble was that his pipework would hold together long enough to prove the concept. The real prize was operational economy. If Fairley's calculations were right, his two-headed engine would haul twice the slate with half the manpower and never need to turn around. For the Festinio Railway, locked in a daily battle with mountains and deadlines, that was a gamble worth taking. Steam hissed from every joint, curling around the feet of men who worked in what crews quickly called the skillet. The nickname stuck for a reason. Inside the cramped central cab of Little Wonder, the firebox glowed a fierce orange, radiating heat from both sides. There was no escape from it. The driver stood wedged between two steel boilers, one on his left, one on his right, sweat running into his eyes even in the Welsh winter. The fireman had it worse. His job was to shovel coal into a fire hole set awkwardly in the middle, twisting sideways to feed the flames while the floor rocked underfoot. Every swing of the shovel meant bracing against the lurch of the engine and the sting of heat on his back. Oral histories from Festinio crews remember the cab as a place where boots stuck to the floor and shirts clung wet to the skin. On uphill runs, men learned to keep a spare handkerchief just to wipe their faces and to watch for copper joints that could fail without warning. The flexible steam pipes, Fairley's pride on the drawing board, became the engine's weak spot in practice. They were made of copper, chosen for their ability to bend as the bogies swiveled.
But with every curve, the metal flexed and strained until cracks opened up under pressure. Steam would spray out in sudden bursts, sometimes scalding, sometimes just blinding. Crews listened for the telltale hiss, knowing that a split joint could turn the cab into a fog of hot vapor in seconds. Maintenance men at Boston Lodge kept a steady trade in patching leaks and replacing lengths of pipe, but the problem never quite went away. Some firemen joked it was like working inside a teapot that never stopped boiling over. Outside the railway, the mockery was relentless. Victorian journals called Little Wonder a circus freak and a push me, pull you. Cartoonists drew it with two faces and a driver doomed to roast between them. On the platform, passengers peered at the engine and laughed, asking which end was forward and how anyone survived the journey. For the men in the cab, the jokes wore thin. They knew every run was a battle with heat, sweat, and the constant threat of a leaking joint. Yet they kept at it, shoveling and steering through the mountain curves, determined to prove that Fairley's monster could do the work no other engine dared attempt. February 11th, 1870. The Festiniog railway station at Porthmadog bristled with anticipation. Engineers, dignitaries, and skeptical journalists crowded the platform, eyes fixed on a contest that would settle months of argument. At the center stood Robert Fairley, calm in the chaos, flanked by the men he hoped to impress, the Imperial Russian Commission, British railway lords, and technical observers from as far as Mexico and India. The challenge was simple, but the stakes were enormous. First, the old guard. The locomotive prince, a veteran of the line, was hitched to a standard train. Fifty tons of slate and timber wagons strained behind it. As the whistle blew, the engine dug in, wheels spinning against the rails. It inched forward, then faltered on the incline, slipping and groaning, unable to conquer the gradient with its rigid frame and limited adhesion. The limit was laid bare for all to see. Then came the spectacle. Fairly ordered every available wagon coupled behind his creation. The train stretched nearly 400 yards, a serpentine line of slate, timber, and passenger cars that wrapped around two curves at once. The crowd murmured, some shaking their heads, the weight was staggering, more than double what any engine had managed on this line. With a signal, the firemen stoked the central furnace, and the dual whistles sounded, one at each end of the machine. Steam surged through the flexible pipes, feeding both sets of cylinders. The little wonder moved as if waking from a dream, first a slow crawl, then a gathering momentum. The powered bogies gripped the rails, distributing force through every driven wheel. There was no slipping, no hesitation. The train wound through the tightest arcs, the front boiler swinging out over the embankment while the wheels stayed true to the rails. Spectators watched as the impossible unfolded. The locomotive not only hauled the entire consist, it did so smoothly at a pace that left the conventional engines far behind. Russian commissioners scribbled notes, faces lit with surprise. By the end of the day, Fairley had secured orders for his design. The laughter stopped. The two-headed monster had turned ridicule into a revolution, and the world's most challenging railways were suddenly within reach. Steam thundered through the highland canyons of Mexico, where the railway from Veracruz to Mexico City clawed its way up more than 8,000 feet in elevation. Here, the fairly design faced its greatest test, not a slate branch winding through Welsh valleys, but a main line that rose from tropical jungles to the thin air of the Altiplano. The gradients were relentless, often steeper than 1 in 25, and the curves twisted through ravines where a misstep meant a plunge into the abyss. American and British locomotives tried and failed, their rigid frames no match for the contorted rails of the Infinilo, known as Little Hell, where the mountains seemed to fight every mile. Mexican engineers ordered something bigger. The fairly monsters that arrived dwarfed their Welsh ancestors. These engines tipped the scales at nearly 100 tons, their double boilers stretching the length of a boxcar, each end perched on a swiveling bogey built to hug the rails. The firebox, still at the heart, burned with the same ferocity, but now it fed a machine that could haul freight and passengers upgrades that would stall a conventional engine in its tracks. Crews learned to trust the articulated grip, eight powered wheels, all biting into the steel, 
even as the track curled tighter than a city street. For nearly 40 years, these double-ended giants worked the Mexican mainline. They became legends among railway men, known for their ability to pull full trains through hairpin bends and up impossible slopes year after year. The Fairley's two-headed silhouette, once a curiosity, became the backbone of mountain railroading in a country where the only way forward was up. The design that began as a gamble in Wales now proved itself on a scale and in a climate that few Victorian engineers could have imagined. The double Fairley's reign over the world's harshest railways was not endless. By the early 20th century, a new rival arrived, the mallet articulated locomotive. Instead of two boilers and a maze of flexible steam pipes, the mallet used a single long boiler with two sets of driving wheels beneath, hinged in the middle. That meant fewer joints to leak, less heat crammed into the cab, and a simpler job for the maintenance crews. The mallet's design could be built even larger, with fewer headaches and lower costs per mile. For accountants and engineers alike, the trade-off was clear. The Fairley's double-headed complexity was outpaced by the mallet's straightforward power. Yet in Wales, the story did not end with obsolescence. The Festiniog Railway made a different calculation. Their line still twisted through the same impossible curves, and no off-the-shelf locomotive could match the Fairley's agility. So, while the rest of the world moved on, Boston Lodge Works kept the tradition alive. In 1979, they rebuilt Murden Emrys, the oldest surviving double Fairley, using modern materials and improved flexible joints. Thirteen years later, they built David Lloyd George from scratch, a brand new double Fairley fitted with a superheated boiler and oil firing for efficiency. Both engines still run today, carrying tourists and slate through the same mountain passes that stumped Victorian engineers. Preservation volunteers and Festinioga's chief mechanical engineers point to the careful balance they have struck. Maintenance is still demanding, but advances in metallurgy and design have solved the worst of the old problems. Flexible joints last longer, cabs are less punishing, and the engines remain the only machines that can tackle the railway's signature 116-foot curves with confidence. The double fairly survives not as a relic, but as a living solution, one that still bends, quite literally, to the will of the mountain. Today, as railways push into ever more extreme landscapes, the lesson endures. Unconventional solutions often outlast their doubters. Fairley's double-ended design isn't just a relic. It's proof that bending the rules can bend reality itself. In a world still shaped by old tracks and new obstacles, sometimes the only way forward is in a direction nobody expected. Would you ride the rails between two roaring boilers?